All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 13th, 2024. I know you guys are going to be saying, no, it isn't. It's the 14th. Well, I'm recording it on Monday, the 13th, because tomorrow, May 14th, is my wife's birthday, the same date when Israel became a nation. And I was thinking, well, maybe I would just do it a day later since tomorrow is going to be dedicated time to my wife. But on Wednesday, I'm getting a tooth extracted, so I won't be up for uh, doing any teaching on Wednesday. So today, the 13th, Monday evening, is my only bet to get this done. And this is take two. I was 45 minutes into the last one, and my computer glitched, and I had to delete and start all over again. Well, for those of you who watched the last video, well, man, if you haven't, you want to go watch this last video. If you've been around for at least a little while and you've started to understand and discern some of these things, this teaching is powerful. It is so power packed. It it really goes into the depth of an, a, what maybe a handful, half dozen or so questions that people have had. Um, just it's one of those videos, one of those teachings that just reminds me. Wow, have we ever been blessed to be given eyes and ears to see and to understand these things, being spirit-led to reveal these things for such a time as this? It is so, so powerful. Well, within that video and within recent videos, I told you guys we were going to, I was going to dedicate one solely to going through the new timeline chart. Now, for anybody that wonders when I say new timeline chart, it's not because the timeline is any different. You see, we usually work off of this one. It's much simpler, much more straightforward with some descriptions down here. But there's no real sense of everything and lined up and so forth. And so our sister Tammy spent a long time in studying the teachings, going to all the scriptures and verses and things we put together for it and put together this incredible timeline chart that people can track and follow themselves and trace it into all of the scriptures where we've tied in each and every one of these portions of time. Now, if I were to go into all of these things, it would be like a five-day teaching, eight hours a day, and we probably still wouldn't be done. So we're not going to be going into that much of level of detail. But what I want to do is I want to spend my time without bouncing too much into going into where the scriptures are, but I will let you know what scriptures they are. However, I will occasionally and less regularly than usual jump into where those scriptures are to help people see and to understand, especially when I do make a point of going into some of the different chapters of the, of, of the scriptures and show you where these things are and how they're connected. But for the most part, I'm just going to spend my time explaining and going through the overall of the chart right here. So we won't spend too much time in everything else, except I always have to do this because there's always going to be new people watching. If you're, if you're new to the ministry or newer and haven't yet watched what we call the intro series, you come to the playlist here on YouTube and you click on this link right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series. Watch the first four videos. It will blow your mind. It will fill you with revelation and understanding like you have never had before. Things, mysteries in scriptures, confusion that we've had in scriptures, things that people have thought were contradictions will all start to come into light. These things are all prophetic and it is incredible once you begin to understand it. The other place you can go is right here, ministryrevealed.com. It'll take you to the website. You come up here to menu, and you come to the intro. When you come here, it'll be the same first four of the same first videos in order, and this is the first one. This one is a 22-minute intro into the next three. The second one is the first of the three in the series, we, and this is a 30-minute Bible study to begin to understand, to begin to show you that the differences within the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
are revealed in the end of days as Luke, Mark, and Matthew, and to show you that they're speaking to three separate groups of people. I know it sounds crazy, but I promise you if you take the time, you will see it for yourself. One simple one I always explain is that when you look at the crucifixion as Christ is going to the cross, in Luke, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. That, that's a bride. If you go to Mark, he's arrayed in purple. If you go to Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors like the woman riding the beast. It is wild once you see it, once you begin to understand. Even in this 30-minute intro, it gives you enough detail to begin to start to understand it for yourself. As you get really good, as you study through these things, you come down to this one. It's a three-hour Bible study of these differences within the Gospels and what they reveal, just as this one will introduce you to. It's going to open up the Scriptures for you as you have never, ever understood before, and it's all about prophecy. It's, it's fantastic. The next video is what you come to realize when you understand these differences within the Gospels. And what you'll come to realize is that the end of days isn't seven years, but 14 years long, and a portion from Luke called above, which is a, which is a period of days called 50. At first, it sounds jarring. Seven years is enough. We don't need more than seven years of tribulation. Well, first of all, you shouldn't have to worry about how long it is. If you're in Christ, spirit-filled, diligently seeking him, you shouldn't have to worry about it because you wouldn't be here, right? But when you understand the differences in the Gospels and what they reveal, you will see for yourself that prophecy isn't only in the discourses, but is all throughout the differences of the stories that are in the Synoptic Gospels. And when you begin to see it, you will realize that the end of days is 14 years and a short period called above. You will then wonder, how on earth was this missed? Well, number one, it just wasn't yet the season and time. And number two, you'll come to see that it's all because of Matthew. All pastors, all teachers, all, all uh, scholars, we have all been taught from the gospel of Matthew. And because of that, we've only looked to Mark and to Luke as other points to understand to tie in to the stories from Matthew. And you see, from, from the creation until Christ is the was. From Christ until the moment of the pre-trib is the is. And from the pre-trib to the end is the is to come. In the is of life, understanding it from Matthew and looking at Mark and Luke, and, and it's not as big a deal. Because all scripture is profitable for us all. But when it comes to prophecy, it's another layer and another level. And that's what's been missed. When everybody's focus is only in Matthew's gospel, and they only think the tribulation is seven years, they only think all of creation is going to be 7,000 years, once you understand Mark's portion and Luke's portion, you can go from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, and everything starts to open and make sense and become more and more clear just like the 14 years and the portion above you will realize that the reason people believe seven years is because everything their foundational understanding comes from in the gospels is found in matthew and matthews is the seven years of trumpet judgments marks is the seven years of seals remember the colors of the robes purple and scarlet tribulation colors and luke's is the pre-trib you will come to see that pre mid and post are all true luke mark and matthew this will reveal to you as you begin to understand those teachings this one here in the discourses <coughs> will reveal to you how to understand what is being said when and where and why and to who during their portions of the discourses as you have never ever seen before and then you keep studying you go all the way through <clears throat> this gets crazy it's all a fractal 
will take you all the way back to the beginning of the creations. Yes, you heard that right. All the way back to the beginning of the creations. But where you want to start is those first four videos. A 22-minute video, two 30-minute videos, and then one big one that's about two hours and 45 minutes. It's all because of Matthew. I promise you, with, with everything that I've ever studied and gone into, I promise you, it'll be worth every moment of your time. And with that, all of these things that you're about to see coming next will all begin to make sense. But right before I jump in there, let me do a quick shout out to our brother in Uganda. Our brother Steve in Uganda, they've been looking for a place in the city of Kampala. That's the main city where he lives. And they, they got kicked out of another place. They got, you know, a whole kerfuffle happened because people don't want them there. And you know the story that, you know, they've been going all around throughout Uganda and the neighboring areas. And tens of thousands of people have been showing up over a course of several events to this over the past year and a half. It has been fantastic. And they were finally able to find a new location in Kampala because they just got kicked out of the last one. They got duped out of it and they just found this new one. So we have some money raised for them and they were still going to need more. They have to put four months down in advance for this place to secure it. Considering we only need three prayerfully, then four should be all that it takes. So if anybody's interested in helping support the ministry, helping the, the word, helping bring many more to salvation in and around Uganda and around the world and spreading the revelation of the end of days to prepare these people with it, then you could always come here. You can click here from right beside Ministry Revealed and we have our PayPal link in there and we have our mailing address in here as well. They're buying Bibles and and some books and, and feeding and and now they have to set up that place where they will be having gatherings all throughout the week, bringing people in, salvation, baptism, all sorts of things. Preaching, of course. So if anybody's led, please uh, help us out. Just click on the link here, or you can go to the link under each video in the description box. So with that, our focus now is going to be on this chart. I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to take it across. And you know what happened? With this, like I said, this is my second recording. <clears throat> the first recording, everything was fine. And all of a sudden, I couldn't slide it around anymore. I don't know what happened. So I had to redo everything. Crazy how that works. <clears throat> That's because this time is going to be better, right? So let me get this started. I'll start right along at the top. You'll notice at the top, it says Gospels are speaking to I just explained to you a little bit of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. What you come to realize is they they represent three three spiritual three portions of group of groups of people all all throughout the earth right now. One of them is a group that's spirit filled, another that is a portion to light, and another that is the portion to flesh. Are we living in the flesh now? Yes. When Christ came, he came to shed his light? Yes. When the Holy Ghost came, he came to give us the Spirit? Yes. <clears throat> Does everybody have all three? Nope. Does every believer have all three? No. Some people just claim Christ. They don't diligently seek him. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not repentant. They're not watching and praying. <clears throat> Remember, there's a difference between pre and mid and mid. When you realize that pre, mid, and post are all true, and they represent Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you go to the creation, and first was the creation of spirit. The second creation was light. The third creation was flesh. Spirit, light, flesh. The three portions of Christ, right? Spirit, light, and flesh. His three pieces of creation, his three portions. He created them all. The first was spirit. And the spirit group, those who are like Romans 8.1, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, we read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that the first group, like it says, above 14 years, they go to the third heaven. 
Then it says, and I knew such a person, so not in Christ like the first group, but they were a believer type, they go to paradise. They're the ones raptured to paradise, <coughs> excuse me, which is the mid-trib in the seventh year of seals, great multitude rapture. And the third group is the group that will inherit the city. They're the ones who are represented as the flesh and they represent the Jews who is their, what have they been waiting for? Their promise. Their promised millennial reign kingdom. Their heaven on earth. This group is pre-trib third heaven. The second group is the great multitude rapture to paradise, the place prepared. And the Matthew flesh portion is for the promised millennial reign for the promise that they would have the millennial reign with their Messiah and King. It's incredible to understand. And you're going to notice that you see seven years here, then seven years of seals, then seven years of trumpets. Is it because the end of days is 21 years? Is our ministry a ministry that talks about 21 years? No, it's, it's really technically about the 14 years but there is a bigger picture that is 21 years and when that final seventh year is done it's the final jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign so how do you understand this we can go to leviticus chapter 25 about the year of jubilee understanding and how to understand it in verse in chapter 25 verse 8 it says thou shalt number seven sabbaths of years unto thee seven times seven years unto thee which is 49 years then you have the jubilee so what is it seven times seven years now is the end of days 49 years long no it's 14 years but there was also a portion which is called like the preparation where where the spirit has been waking up the bride and i believe it began at the revelation 12 sign in september of 2017 making this year that we're in the seventh year what we call the first seven quote unquote easy years do you remember when jacob worked for leah he served seven years before he got anything and he served those seven years and he said that he was so in love that they flew by like days even though they were seven years he was expecting rachel but he got leah you see so you had seven years and then what does it tell us then he worked he got rachel but he still had to work another seven years before rachel was now officially his that's what we read in genesis chapter 31 verse 41 of the 14 years that i worked for your two daughters and then what does it say does it say then i worked seven more years for your cattle no it says then i worked six more years for your cattle which is a total in the big picture of 20 years of the 21. And what does it say in Genesis 31, 41? When those 20 years were over, as soon as they were over to start that 21st year, he makes a covenant with his father-in-law. That'll be interesting. You're going to want to remember that. So it's 20 years and the 21st year, he makes a covenant with his father-in-law. We've showed this same typology without the seven easy, even in the story of 14 years with Abraham and his two sons. Abraham has Ishmael when he's 86 years old. So now we're on the 14-year line. Abraham is 86 years old. And he has Ishmael. When Abraham is 99 years old, 13 years later, in Gen from Genesis 16, in Genesis 17, 
It says Abraham is now 99 years old, which is 13 years later, and Ishmael is 13 years. And what does the father do? He makes a covenant of circumcision with Abraham and his family. And guess what happens in chapter 21 of Genesis? In chapter 21, which is like the big picture of the 21 years, we get the picture that ends the 13 years of Abraham with Ishmael, then the Lord making a circumcision covenant. And who shows up in chapter 21 of Genesis? Isaac is born. Isaac, the promise. He is a typology of Christ showing up at the end of 13 or 99 years for Abraham, which is 13 years later from when Ishmael was born and Isaac and Abraham was 86 to the birth, which is a prophetic typology of the coming of Christ feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. And you'll see these things as we end up going into some of these chapters and verses where these things are connected as well. It's it's all over the place. It's filled with all of these things. So what you come to realize in relation to the seven times seven years, this easy seven, like the Leah portion, this seven as the Rachel portion, and this six to the seventh year, which is the covenant, is the final 49th year. The other sevens are just the other years that came before. Then it was the third last seven, the second last seven, and the final seven years. And at the final seventh year of tribulation, it's the 49th year, just like it told us in Leviticus. And when the final 14th year is over, it's the Jubilee. It is the revelation of the end of days. Now, we've taught on this a number of times. But when we look at the Leah group, who like, um, who like Leah, Jacob was actually working for Rachel and then ended up having to get Leah. He thought he was duped by it and everything else. But what did he say? He said his father-in-law told him, you have to have the older before you could have the younger. You see, because it wasn't their culture to give the younger before the older we've got teachings on this about the difference of what winter wheat means and what spring wheat means spring wheat is called new wheat and winter wheat is called old wheat is it because it's old no it's because it's planted in the fall takes root grows throughout spring into summer and the harvest begins in summer it's usually late may uh, sorry late spring and grows and, and is harvested through summer because it starts late May to mid, uh, uh, mid-June is the beginning when the sickle is put to the winter wheat. That is when you begin your seven Sabbaths count of the, of the Feast of Weeks, when you put the sickle to the wheat. It's winter wheat. But the world has forgotten or misunderstood that there's a winter wheat and they've all only counted spring wheat. They've only counted spring wheat. So when they look to spring wheat like a Rachel, they're looking for the great multitude rapture. And remember what I said about Matthew? Because everything is looked through the eyes of Matthew, they think only seven years of tribulation. It's as if they're looking at spring wheat and the harvest of spring wheat and trying to make the count of it, well, that's the great multitude rapture group. The world has missed the seven years that are coming first because the first one to go is Leah, not Rachel. It's fantastic. We've got some incredible teachings on this that will really, really help you to understand. You know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's incredibly wild when you see every one of these details right here from the spirit Third heaven, Leah, older, winter wheat, white robe, all of these things. When you see their connections and their differences to the next three, it, it really, really begins to open up your understanding. So as we go forward, 
I don't want to go into and keep going all um all the way across. I'll be kind of going up and down going across this way. And the way it works is here's your seals. There's your seals judgments, right? And here's your trumpet judgments. What most people, and I want to clarify this because a lot of people have asked me this over the years. Is it like year one is the first seal, year two is the second seal, year three is the third seal? No. We explain this even in Baruch. So in the in the apocryphal book of Second Baruch, he's asking about the tribulation. Will it last a, last a long time? And he goes on to explain to them to him. For these parts of that time are reserved and will be mixed one with another, and they will minister to each other. For some of these parts will withhold a portion of themselves while taking from others, and some will accomplish their portion as well as that of others. What that's saying is it's not like one seal, one year, two seal, second year, third year, third seal, fourth year, fourth seal. No. There will be the first seal, and then the second, third, fourth, but the second will will be the one more dramatic, and then it'll it'll settle, but it'll still be going, and then the third one kicks in while the second one is still going strong, and then picks up strength again, and then the fourth seal comes in, but it'll kind of be mixed throughout. So it's not just one seal or one trumpet per year, okay? That's what it's explaining to us. In fact, Baruch is so good, Look at what he tells us. For the measure and the calculation of that time is two parts a week of seven weeks. Well, how about that? Isn't that what I just explained to you? These are what? Seven weeks of years. There are seven times seven for 49. And the end of days is what? Two parts a week of seven weeks. One seven week, two seven weeks of the seven. Seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, the final two sevens of the Jubilee count. Just as Baruch said. It's awesome. So what else? How else do we know this is laid out? One of the big things to understand is Israel. Is How, do, how can you understand 70 years of Israel? The answer comes to us in part from Leviticus chapter 19 verse 23 through 25. But there was another mystery that was kind of within it as well that needed to be understood. We're not going to go into all of it except to say that there was a discovery in the 90s or 80s that when you count the kings in the Bible and go from one king to the next to the next that were in the land of Israel, there was a gap that continued to spread and it threw off all of the time counts of these kings throughout history until these two guys on separate occasions over the years discovered that the house of Israel had a way of counting their kings from Nisan and the house of Judah had a way of counting their kings from the seven month of Tishri. So one was from the first month of Nisan and the other one did it from the seventh month of Tishri to begin the counting of their kings. That was one of the things that helped us understand the timing of the end of days as well as the discourses. Well, there, there's a way. I'm not making it up when I say it will begin the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets. It will end the first six years and start the seventh year of seals at the Feast of Trumpets. It will end 20 years or the 13th year of tribulation at the Feast of Trumpets with the Lord returning feet down on the day and hour no one knows. It will end the 14th year at the Feast of Trumpets and then it will be what? 10 more days. 10 more days to atonement, which is exactly what it says as we showed in Leviticus 25 that at atonement, <clears throat> excuse me, the trumpet of the Jubilee is sounded 10 days later. Okay? It is going to begin the 14 years at the day and hour no one knows on the Feast of Trumpets. However, there is a portion of time called 50 days that comes first. And Leviticus chapter 19, 
verse 23 through 25 was important extremely important to understand along with understanding the differences of how the house of israel and the house of judah counted their kings when you understand the house of judah begins to count their kings from the feast of trumpets which is in tishri the seventh month that begins to give you the understanding of the timing of the 14 years but what you had to understand is that leviticus 19 <clears throat> tells us when you come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food they came into the land 1948 they planted in i think february of 1949 then because it's judah in the land the counting of the king didn't start until 1949 at the feast of trumpets you add the five years to and then the 70 years and guess where we are right now we're in the 70th year as we speak right now these are the seven easy years we call them of leah and do you know what it said for leah check this out in the story with jacob working for his two wives starting with the first one expecting rachel but getting leah you guys will remember this in a recent teaching the word fulfill her week which is laban telling jacob that he has to have the older leah before he can have the younger rachel he says fulfill leah's week leah's week is the first time the word week for feast of weeks shows up in scripture and what have we shown happens that the 50 days that happened the portion called above that happens before the 14 years will begin at the true feast of weeks at the feast of weeks the feast of weeks is a one-day event but it's connected to the seven-day pre-trib wedding of the escape of the gentile bride of christ it's the seven-day wedding it's awesome to understand that we're talking about leah who is the older who represents the winter wheat that we're in the 70th year and that we know from zechariah you go down in and you scroll through and you get to zechariah chapter one and you scroll through and it says these 70 years these 70 years how long O lord will you not have compassion on your land on jerusalem it's talking about the 70th year we've got no other understanding for the 70th year that's left this is the end of the line so it's very exciting but what happens before the end of that 70th before the end of that final seventh year there's a period of 50 days and it begins as i said with the escape of the pre-trib gentile bride at the true feast of weeks that comes at the end of the seven sabbaths of weeks for the fe feast of weeks count which begins from when the sickle is put to the winter wheat it happens late may to mid-june every year this year it's about mid-june and seven sabbaths brings us to the eighth of av guess how many days from the ninth of av are left there are 50 days left in the year how does it start when the seventh sabbath is over pre-trip the bridal wedding the the leia wedding at the feast of weeks and what did what did laban say to jacob fulfill her week fulfill her feast of weeks seven day wedding it's the wedding week what happens at the beginning of all of this it's the seven day wedding because how the 50 days breaks down is it's seven days then 40 days and then three days it starts with the pre-trib right on day one 
what's going to happen is the Son of Man will meet with a remnant group of disciples whom he has chosen in advance, and he will inform right before the pre-trip. Then he's going to take the pre-trip bride. The seven-day wedding is going to happen. He will have anointed his modern-day apostles on the same day that the pre-trip escape takes place. And then there's going to be an attack. This attack right here is the attack that we find in Isaiah 9-1. You see where that is? I, chapter, right? Book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 1, is the first attack. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, it's the light affliction that comes to two northern cities in Israel, which I believe will be connected prophetically in the is to come as Haifa and Tel Aviv. This attack will happen on the 9th of Av, right after the pre-trib bride is taken out. Then what do we have? You have the seven-day wedding. When the seven-day wedding's over, <coughs> excuse me, the Son of Man is coming to fulfill 40 days as he said he would as Jonah. When he comes as these for these 40 days, he's coming as the white horse rider. Yes, the Son of Man is coming on the eighth day, which is day one of the 40. He is coming as the white horse rider. We've got videos. We have broken this down. We have proven it. We have shown it. And what happens? He's going to meet with the apostles, then the disciples that he chose here, and the apostles that he anointed here. It will be called the group that is the first watch. That is the disciple group called the first watch who will be with them during those 40 days, learning for them. He's going to give them a banquet meal, and they represent his two witnesses. They're a typology of the Moses and Elijah, the John's Moses Elijah types that are going to be the workers during seals. Not that there's only two guys, but that if there is two, they're going to be working with a group of thousands of others. And they each group represents a Moses type and the other one represents an Elijah type. They are both a foreshadow of, a, again, a type of John. The Son of Man will be here for 40 days warning, as we've said he would do in the Gospel of Luke. So we scroll down here to the Gospel of Luke, and we come to chapter 19 in the 40 days right here, when from verse 28 to 44, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, tells them that they're going to be compassed about. They weren't prepared for the time of their visitation. This is it right here. What else do we have? We have Luke chapter 21, verse 25 through 28. That's going to happen during the 40 days as well. It's connected to the stone's throw that's going to happen, which will take place probably at the later portion of the seven days. It'll be connected to the Son of Man coming to begin his 40 days when he comes he's going to be warning as 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 revelation 20 uh, sorry as luke 21 says he's going to be warning them that they're being compassed about that they're going to be destroyed just as he said in luke 19 for 40 days he's going to be warning is he only going to warn in jerusalem or is he going to warn elsewhere around the world i don't know but I do know that he's going to be for sure in Jerusalem and in Israel. When he comes, remember, he's coming after the first attack. The first attack that's going to happen in Haifa and Tel Aviv at the beginning, right after the pre-trib is taken, this attack and this war is only going to last about seven days. The world is going to want to settle it because tens of millions of people have just vanished. There's chaos already breaking out everywhere, and this attack happened in northern Israel. So it will be a short Middle East attack that will take place. But when the Son of Man comes on the eighth day, it will have already been settled because they don't want it to go in to full-out world war. 
Hence, when the white horse rider comes and the events taking place and the warning that Jerusalem is about to be surrounded. So then when the 40 days are done, the disciples followed him. The apostles are already out doing their thing. The disciples followed him for 40 days. Messiah will leave. I've had people say, well, how does Messiah leave? Is he just going to just vanish away? Yeah, why not? Isn't that exactly what he did at the end of his 40 days last time? That's exactly what it prophetically tells us he's going to do. When those 40 days are over, what do we have? We have the end of seven days, the 40 days, and we have three days left in the 50. What happens in those three days? The raven spirit, that red horse rider spirit, if you will, or or not really the red horse rider spirit. That's the one that gives the sword. It's not the Antichrist. But the spirit of the raven, which the raven means Arab, goes out. And Jerusalem will now start to be surrounded during these final three days of the 50. At the end of the three days, they're going to know during these three days, because they were being warned by the Son of Man and by disciples and so forth, to flee. So they're going to see this surrounding taking place, and that is their cue to flee to the mountains. Right towards the end of those three days, guess what happens? It's the Holy Ghost. It's what we call Acts 2.0. The 50 days come to an end, and guess when it is? It's at the literal end of the year in a Jewish count calendar for the kings of Judah. It will be Elul 29. That's the 50 days from the 9th of Av to Elul 29. Right at the time when grape harvesting has happened for new grapes, just like in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, when they were accused of being drunk on new wine. On new wine. Do you realize there's no way for them to be drunk on new wine in May? The grapes aren't ready. The grapes aren't ready till September, October. When you understand the true count of winter wheat, of the true Feast of Weeks, and the count to true Pentecost, it all makes sense. And all you have to do is look at the literal harvest taking place on the earth. And guess where the 50 days ends? Those disciples that were with the Son of Man for 40 days will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost and they will go out from Jerusalem into different parts of the world right at that moment. And then what happens? Bang! 14 years begin. This raven spirit, Syria, the, the lion, the lion who is a beast from Daniel 7, who was compassing them about, who is directly connected to the typology of Ishmael, will then attack Jerusalem on the day and hour no one knows, which will be the Feast of Trumpets. And the second seal will have begun, which is why it says the, the peace is taken from the earth. Peace is taken from the earth. The Holy Ghost is gone after anointing that group on the earth and then what happens? A great sword is given that they should kill one another. And how does it start? It starts with the attack on Jerusalem. It starts with Mark's discourse. When Mark's discourse in chapter 13 says nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that is the red horse rider, the second seal that begins the 14 years, and it starts with the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem and all Jews fleeing who have survived fleeing out to the mountains some being taken captive and others making it to the mountains you see they're now going to be removed from the land of Jerusalem for the next seven years only a small group will be brought back to allow them to start to rebuild. And the world is going to think that they're going to start to rebuild the temple. But they're not. They will only get the foundation laid 
in the seven years of seals. Only the foundation will be laid, but not the temple. Well, of course, think about it. Jerusalem has now been attacked and destroyed. Jews are fleeing, and World War III breaks out shortly after. I always say World War III will officially begin at the attack on Jerusalem that will destroy Jerusalem and have Jews fleeing for their lives. That is the beginning of World War III and the beginning of the 14 years. Like I said, peace is taken from the earth. The lion is Assad that brings the attack and then the bear will bring about the destruction against the Gentiles, which is all about World War III beginning from the second attack in Israel, which will be against Jerusalem. And World War III will now begin. World War III is this portion right here. It will last about the first two and a half years of seals. Now, will wars continue on and everything past that? Yes, but not in the same sense. They become more against nations, uh, you know, in, in diverse areas. But the big overall World War III will last for the first two and a half years of the 14 years of tribulation. This is why in Mark's discourse, as I mentioned to you, in Mark's discourse, it tells us nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. There shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This right here is the first two and a half years of tribulation, of World War III with famines and roilings, which means roilings of water, disturbances of water. If you go to Luke's discourse, you'll notice this, that in Luke's discourse is where we get a really exciting clue as to the things I had just explained earlier. In verse 10, it says, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes, feel for sights, great signs. But look at verse 12. But before all these. This means before the red horse rider that begins Mark 13's tribulation time. Luke's has this portion called before or above. That portion from Luke's is this portion right here. It's all about the 40 days that are described after that. If you go down to verse, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, 34, 35, and 36 of Luke 21, it's talking about the pre-trib, those who will be able to what? Escape all these things that shall come to pass. So the end of Luke's discourse is talking about a group of people accounted worthy to escape everything that is listed above before it comes. But that stuff that's listed above before it comes is going into the description of the events of 40 days when the Son of Man returns from the seven-day wedding. Okay? So what we're seeing here is now at the Red Horse Rider, the second seal, the 14 years begin with the attack that's going to be against Jerusalem, destroying it, making them flee. The lion, the World War III has begun. It's going to last about two and a half years. Now, how do we know this? Well, what else did it say? There would be famine too, right? Isn't that exactly what it said? So you got the red horse, you got the black horse. There's going to be a bunch of killing. All we have to do is go to Revelation chapter 6 and we see the red horse was given power to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another and there was given a great sword. That begins, that's the one that begins the attack on Jerusalem. And then look at what we see that follows. The black horse, a pair of balances, right? It's about famine. Will it be literal famine? Yes, it will be famine of food and so forth, but it will also be famine from the word of God. 
because persecution and wanderings will begin. Not to the point of Antichrist yet, but it will be the beginning of these things. But what else is going to take place during these first two and a half years? The greatest revival in human history. The greatest revival in human history will take place during the first two and a half years. Of course it will. I used to always say, you know, when the Twin Towers came down, the churches got full for about six weeks. Imagine tens of millions of people vanishing and the entire planet erupting in World War III. People will be crying out for a savior like it's nobody's business. That's why the greatest revival in human history takes place during tribulation and why the great multitude that no man can number is going to take place at the end of the tribulation of seals. See how it makes sense? So what happens during these two and a half years? Yes, Jerusalem is destroyed. The uh, World War III breaks out. The Black Horse is also released within that time. Famine of food and of the word. And do you know how crazy scripture gets about this? I saw a video. A lady today talked about it uh, happening. I think it was in, uh, oh, shoot, where was it? I can't remember where it was she was talking about it. But we've we've shared about this in Scripture. You know, that they're going to be eating each other. Isn't that crazy? It's going to get so bad. This famine, it'll be nothing the world has ever seen on this size of scale before. Because it's all happening during World War III. There's no mark of the beast yet. It's just people trying to survive. It's not going to your nine to five job. It's not going to be life as usual. It's going to be everything screeching to a halt. They're not going to be mass producing your food for you. They're not going to be shipping things over from China to, to help serve your needs. The first two and a half years is going to be World War III. It said not a place on earth would be spared. He talks about it in here. He even says uh, in 2 Baruch, Is it in one place or in only one part of the earth where these things will come to pass? Or will it be experienced by the whole earth? And it's, he says, Whatever happens at that time will befall the whole earth. What did Luke 21 tell us? Luke 21, verse 34, tells us, uh, in verse 35, you know, don't be caught off in drunkenness. Verse 35 says, For as a snare will it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. It's going to be the entire planet at war. Could you imagine the craziness that that's going to be? For two and a half years. So much so that those who aren't saved, those that aren't crying out and, and receiving Christ during the revival that will take place in the midst of craziness, they'll be crying out for anybody to save them. Do you see why the Antichrist doesn't show up on the scene right away? Will he already be around? Yes. Will he have power as the beast yet? No. Not until about two and a half years in. As you see right here, in the third year, which is two and a half. So in the midst of the third year, the first beast gets his power to continue 42 months. You see, because the world will have been desperate. And the enemies waiting to get it to such a desperation where everybody, well, where, where most of the world, will cry out for anybody to save them. That's when he will step forward. That's when he comes into play. This is Revelation chapter 13, when the Antichrist begins his, 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 um, his time, but it's the time when it says he will continue 42 months. Why continue? Because he was still here at the beginning, which means he's probably here now. 
but he won't be revealed with this power from Satan until this point. And the reason you see the was here in uh, the first beast is because of what we've revealed in Revelation chapter 7, uh, sorry, 17. When you understand it, it, we talked about it in the last video, uh, in the one with the questions. Because when you understand that the beast that has seven heads, that there's seven mountains, and that those seven mountains are seven kings, five are past, one is, and one is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space, then it says the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. I explained that in the previous teaching. This was is what we're seeing right here. This is when he gets his power to continue for 42 months. But there will come a point where he's killed and then he is not. And then there will come a point when the pit is opened and he comes out of the pit as the son of perdition and that is when he shall be. <clears throat> so what you see here is after about two and a half years from the beginning of the 14 years on the destruction of Jerusalem, the first beast, Antichrist, will show up. Who else will show up? The second beast, the false prophet. The false prophet will point to the first beast, Antichrist, and we know he's going to do many signs and wonders to get people convinced to worship the first beast. Now, let me show you something fascinating within this. Knowing that Mark's discourse begins the 14 years and starts it from verse 8 with nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, there's your famines. You see, all of this is the first portion of tribulation. All the way until Mark's discourse goes into the abomination of of desolation the abomination of desolation you see right here the abomination of desolation which happens about two and a half years in when the beast gets his power to continue 42 months when the second beast who is the false prophet gives points to him and and does miracles before him so everybody starts to worship the first beast after they've been gone through world war three gone through famines they're crying out for anybody if they haven't yet come to Christ. And what does the second beast introduce? The second beast introduces the first abomination of desolation, which will be the Revelation 13 mark of the beast. Did you notice how I said there's no beast here yet in the first two and a half years? He doesn't have his power, so he's not quote-unquote, officially on the scene. Neither does, neither is the false prophet. In Mark's gospel, in his discourse, here's your red horse rider, tribulation beginning, and there's no conversation here about false prophet or false Christ. Then it's the time of the abomination of desolation in Mark's gospel, that says standing where it ought not, which can also mean to place where it ought not, okay? To establish, to make, it's like being a covenant with the enemy, to be placed where it ought not. This is the Revelation 13 time of the mark of the beast. And when you read through it and it says, whoa, it's going to be a time worse than ever at this point in all of creation unto this time. Why? Look who shows up. False Christs and false prophets, of which the main one is the false Christ, Antichrist, and the false prophet. Interesting, isn't it? They weren't there in the first half, really officially on the scene. Not until the time of the mark of the beast of Revelation 13 do we see the beast getting his power to continue 42 months, and the second beast, who is the false prophet, bringing in the mark of the beast, which is the first abomination in Mark's discourse, to get people to worship the first beast. 
And the discourse even had it laid out like that. No mention of them until the time of the first abomination. What happens at the first abomination? What does Mark's discourse say? They're to flee. This is another time of fleeing. This is when they what? The sheep are scattered and flee to the mountains. Well, that's interesting, right? This is in the big picture of 21 years. Think of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has 21 chapters in it. The book of Genesis, of course, has 50, but we have shown how the first 21 chapters of Genesis have the same typologies in them as the first as the 21 chapters of John. So, who do we know shows up on the scene? The beast, the antichrist, the abomination is coming. The image of the beast. And what's going to happen? The sheep are going to be scattered because the wolf is coming. The image of the Antichrist is coming. So look what happens if we scroll and we go into Genesis 10. See, one chapter per year. We come to Genesis 10 lined up with the 10th year uh, in, in the big picture of 21, right? The third year of the 14-year tribulation. And we come down to John in his gospel. And we see chapter 10 is in the same alignment as we see right here, the third year of tribulation, or in the big picture, the equivalent of the 10th year. Well, let's go see what John chapter 10 tells us. See if we can find a correlation. Verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door unto the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a robber and a thief. Okay? What else do we see? Um, and a stranger will they not follow. So remember, those who called out to Christ, who came and were part of the, of the greatest revival in the midst of this chaos, they're going to cry out to him. And it says, and a stranger... Will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Listen to what it then goes on to say. Verse 10, the thief comes not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Who's that thief? We'll keep reading. I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Verse 12. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not sees the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. Who's coming? The wolf. The wolf is coming into the sheepfold. He's coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But those who will not recognize his voice because they've accepted Christ will flee from him. It's the exact same chapter to year, chapter 10 of John, that lines up with the timing of the Antichrist showing up. The one who will come not through the gate, but by some other way, who is the wolf who will come in in sheep's clothing to lie, cheat, steal, and kill. Watch this. Look what happens when we go to Genesis chapter 10. In Genesis chapter 10, watch this. There's the 10th year in the big picture. We come to Genesis chapter 10. What do we know is going to happen? Well, it's going to be abomination of desolation, the one from Mark, which is the mark of the beast, which is what? The image, right? The idol. Look what happens in chapter 10. It's Nimrod. Who is Nimrod? He's the actual typology of the Antichrist. You've all heard this. It says in Cush beget Nimrod, he beget, uh, and he began to be a mighty one 
in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. They're going to begin to what? Build the tower of Babel. And the Lord had to what? Divide the earth and so forth, right? Right where you have the first picture of an antichrist type in the book of Genesis. Right there. Everybody knows that story. And it's directly in line, giving us another typology of the timing of the Antichrist showing up on the scene. It's amazing how it lines up over and over and over again. Now what? Now we can go on. The pale horse. You know, the pale horse might still be a part of these earlier years as well. Okay? But listen to what happens to the pale horse, which is why it makes more sense that it's after the beast gets his power to continue 42 months. Because it says, at the pale horse, it says, death in Hades followed with them. Okay, let's go to Genesis, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 6. Oh, uh, sorry, Revelation, yeah, chapter 6. And we go to the pale horse, the fourth seal. And it says what? Over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So you see how some of this can be connected to events happening even earlier, that the third, uh, the second, third, and fourth might even be open kind of together. But where he's really, where the pale horse is really going to step up is probably more so related to that third, fourth year of tribulation of seals. A quarter of the earth killed a quarter of the earth remember what's happening during that time it's the abomination of desolation those who were part of the great revival and those who will still be coming to christ in that second part of seals they've had to flee because they have to refuse the mark of the beast so they have fled into the wilderness exactly as mark's discourse says when they would have to flee well guess what remember what happened with uh with uh, um moses and the typology of moses and let my people go and they they fled from egypt and they fled into the wilderness when right around passover right oh at the time of passover well guess what the 14 years begins at the Feast of Trumpets. What's two and a half years later when the beast gets his power and the abomination mark of the beast shows up? It's two and a half years later. That would be from Tishri to Nisan, Passover. All connected. The timing of everything is directly in line. So now what else has been happening during this time? We know a quarter of the earth and all that at some point connected through all of it, but definitely really kicking into power or into place because of the power that the beast has over all of the earth by about middish seals. His mark of the beast, people that have fled into the wilderness. Well, what else has happened? The foundation was laid, remember? The foundation is laid. We understand this, and we've been able to show this through the seven churches. We can show in the seven churches that Ephesus is the beginning of the 50 days when the Lord, right after the pre-trib, breathes on and anoints the apostles. Then you have Smyrna. Smyrna begins the 40 days when the Lord returns from the wedding and the disciples are with him, following him for 40 days, both of which the apostles and the disciple workers will remain through to at least the end of seals. 
when Pergamum, which is the third church, comes into place, what's it connected to? Well, look at that. It's connected to the two and a half year time frame. In the midst of the third year is the beginning of Pergamum. And what does Pergamum talk about? Pergamum talks about, I know where Satan's seat is. Them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. You mean like Baal and Babylon? When the beast, when the Antichrist gets his power to continue 42 months, which like in the Ministry Revealed book shows that the historical typology of the is since Christ is Constantine. Constantine was an is, right, in, in, like in the last 2,000 years, he was a type of Antichrist. Trying to get everybody to convert, right? He was a type of Antichrist. And he represents the portion of Pergamum. But in relation now to the foundation being laid, how do we know when it's going to get laid? Well, we've explained that by the midst of seals, somewhere in the fourth year, the foundation, as I said, will have been laid. The foundation of the temple will be laid in Jerusalem. It seems crazy that with the second attack and World War III then breaking out, that they will have allowed a group of people to come in to start rebuilding. But that's exactly what's going to happen. We've shown it. In fact, there's such a clear piece to understand in 1 Kings chapter 6. Listen to what it says. The last two verses. In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month of Ziph. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bool, which is the eighth month, was the house finished. And it took seven years to build it. So what happens? In the seventh year, uh, sorry, in the fourth year, the foundation is laid. And it's going to take what? Seven years before it's complete. The first three and a half years of trumpet judgments, which we'll get into here in a bit. The first three and a half years of trumpet judgments is the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. And the temple is going to be built on the foundation that was laid back in the fourth year of seals. The temple will not be built until the beginning of trumpet judgments. And look at where it ends. The 11th year. In the 11th year, about 10 and a half years total since tribulation began, then the temple will be complete. Look at what it said. In the fourth year, the foundation was laid. In the 11th year was the temple finished. Seven years total in building from the fourth year to the 11th. Exactly. From the fourth year to the 11th. It's fantastic when you understand it. Now you want to see something wild? Remember, we're now in the fourth year of the Tribulation of Seals. Antichrist has now been going, rocking his, his 42 months with all of that power going out after everybody. And I don't mean rocking in a good sense. I mean just like crushing, going after everybody. And all those that are sided with him. The, the, the ten kings that are the ten horns. The beast with him. Uh, the false prophet beast with them. But now look at this. Here's that fourth year. Foundation is laid. Watch what happens now. As we follow this fourth year foundation laid. And we follow it and go to. One of our favorite prophetic books. Zechariah. We go to chapter four. Of Zechariah. Chapter four of Zechariah. See foundation laid. Zechariah is one of those books that just so happens to have 14 chapters. It's amazing how it works, right? And look what happens in chapter 4. Um, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also finish it. Wow. Chapter 4, in the fourth year was the foundation laid. 
and his hands will finish it. Pretty wild, right? Right in the fourth year when the foundation is being laid. In this one, let me skip ahead a little bit. Because when the trumpet judgments start, which is the 14th year, or the, the, the eighth year of tribulation, or the, four, the, the first year of trumpet judgments, the city, the streets, and the temple will be rebuilt. Which means it's going to begin in the first year of trumpet judgments, which if we go again to Zechariah right here, that would be chapter 8. Chapter 8. So we follow up chapter 8, first year of trumpet judgments in the book of Zechariah, where the city streets and temple will be built. Watch this. Zechariah chapter 8. Listen to what he says. We'll talk about this in a bit. Let's see what he says down here. Verse 9. Verse 9 and verse 10. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day, that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before these days, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace. Remember, peace was removed at the red horse rider? To him that went out or came in because of the affliction, because it began at the red horse rider, for I set all men, every one against his neighbor, red horse rider. What are they going to start doing now? Rebuilding the temple upon the foundations that were laid and completed in chapter 4. Pretty wild, right? All of it in order. All of it in order. Let's go to the next one. So we're in the three and a half years, that what I call technically, quote unquote, the second half of seals. The first half was about two and a half years. Then you've got the three and a half years. What is the three and a half years? Well, it's the last three and a half years to the end of the first six years of tribulation. To the end of the first six years of seals. Okay? Just like this right here. To the end of the first... Let me click on it. To the end of the first six years of seals. What is three and a half years? 42 months. You see? The beast, the first beast and the second beast with them, 42 months. It's the 42 months of the abomination of desolation in Mark's discourse. It's the mark of the beast. Until what? Until we get to Revelation chapter 6 and we get to the sixth seal. We see the sun, black as sackcloth, right? Moon became as blood. Uh, stars of heaven fell. Kings of the earth and great men, all of them hiding in the mountains and saying, rocks fall on us and mountains fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. So they are seeing at the end, at the end of the sixth year of seals, they are seeing the lamb coming. Somehow, they're seeing something coming. Well, guess what? Right at this point, they're seeing him coming. And what, what do we know is coming? Well, we have here, this is right near the very end. See this sword right here? This wrath of the lamb. Remember, they're afraid of the wrath of the lamb that's coming. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. This is the reason for the sword right here. This is them seeing the Lord coming. Well, when is he coming? Well, if the 14 years began at the Feast of Trumpets, and six years is coming to an end, when the Lord shows up, 
He's coming at the Feast of Trumpets. They might see him coming just before the Feast of Trumpets, right? But he's coming right here at the end of six years. Do you know what's taking place at that point? The first sword. This first sword is the same sword where we can go to the book of Revelation, and it's what? Revelation chapter 17. You see? Revelation 17, 12 through 17. What is it? It's when the lamb fights against the beast and the 12 horns that were all given a kingdom one hour with the beast. What battle is this? It's the battle of Gog in the land of Magog. Watch this. Let's go follow the, the, the books, the scriptures, and let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel has these chapters with the events taking place, and Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel 39, let's scroll up. Look at that. Ezekiel 39 connected to the final year. It's late in the year. It's right near the end of it, which is the Ezekiel 39 battle, which is the Revelation 17 sword of the Lord. Do you remember what it says in Ezekiel chapter 39? Watch this. In Ezekiel chapter 39, we know Right, that it's the battle of Gog in the land of Magog. Watch what it says. It says in verse 9, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel, so, right, the battle is taking place, okay? He's destroyed them, and I will send fire on Magog, okay? So the Lord's come down, destroyed them with fire. Look at what it says in 2 Esdras. 2 Esdras and the sun will be revealed, as you saw, coming up from the sea. Uh, where is it? Da, 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 da. And a great multitude, an innumerable multitude, gathered together, desiring to come to conquer him. But he shall stand on the top of Mount Zion. And Mount Zion shall be prepared, uh, will, uh, shall be made manifest to people, prepared and built, as you saw, a mountain carved without hands. See? And then how does he kill them? He kills them with what's symbolized by the flames. By the storm and the flames, he destroys them before he gathers unto himself those that are the peaceable ones, the great multitude rapture. That's from 2 Ezra 13. So look at what we see. Ezekiel 39, he destroys them, right? With the flames sending fire. And after he destroys them, it's a quick battle. It's the same battle, as I said, as Revelation chapter 17, when he fights against the beast and the ten horns. And when he's defeated them, listen to what it says. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the handstaves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. How many people have ever been able to explain that to you? They're going to burn them for seven years. Well, if he just destroyed them at the end of the sixth year of seals, how long are they going to be burning weapons for? Seven years. Seven years from what? From the seventh year of seals. From the beginning of the seventh year. This is the seventh year of seals. That's one year. And then... Six years of trumpets. Hello. Six years of trumpets and one year of seals. They will be burning weapons for seven years. Remember? They're burning weapons for seven years. And yet, we've got scripture that tells us they're also beating them into plowshares and so forth, right? Right? But then we've got scripture that says they're going to beat their plowshares into swords and their pruning hooks into spears. Isn't that crazy? Why would it go from one back into the other? Because the Lord has another sword destruction coming 
at the end of 13 years when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. Isn't that wild? We'll get into that one in a little bit. So what else do we read in Ezekiel 39? They're going to be burning the weapons now for seven years. And then what does it say? In seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them that they may cleanse the land. For seven months, they're going to be burying bones. Well, guess what? When the Lord destroys them, and it's that Ezekiel 39 war, they're going to now be burning them for seven years, the last year of seals and six years of trumpets, before turning them back into weapons for the final year of tribulation, which is the 14th year. At this battle, once it's over, there's one year of seals for which he says there's going to be seven months of bearing bones. Do you know what happens in relation to the connection to Leah compared to Rachel? Rachel, as I told you earlier, is the younger that represents spring wheat. Spring wheat. Spring wheat is harvested in the fall at the same time as grapes. But the wheat that is harvested in the fall, which is the spring wheat, meaning it was planted in the spring after Passover, it's harvested in the fall, but they cannot use it because it's called new wheat. So they cannot use it until the following year at Passover. I believe that it might be that the great multitude rapture happens at first Passover, but I believe the great multitude rapture will happen at second Passover. Because at the Ezekiel 39 war, when it's over, they're burying bones, it says, for seven months. For seven months. If the end of six years is the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets, and we can prove it, because in Mark's discourse, at the coming of the Son of Man, when the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall, you see? Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And when they see him coming in the clouds, what is it? The day and hour no one knows. Why? Because the Lord is coming at the Feast of Trumpets exactly six years from when the tribulation began. When he comes in the clouds at the end of the sixth year of seals, on the day and hour no one knows, that is the time of the Ezekiel, right at the end of the sixth year, is the Ezekiel 39 war, where they're killed, and then there's bearing of bones, for which we know if this is the fall feast time, then the spring wheat is being gathered up but it cannot be used because it's new wheat till the following year at passover which is at least six months but if christ knowingly we already know he fulfilled first passover then what has he got to fulfill second passover do you know that second passover is seven months later and second passover do you know why there's a second passover because people were too far away to make it in time and travel to get to the first Passover. And they're going to be spread across the world for one. But what's the other reason? If they were near a dead body or touched it. Then they would be unclean. So they will have to wait to make it to the second Passover. Which is seven months later from the end of the sixth year of seals. Do you see how all of this connects? Continuously, over and over and over. It connects. 
Watch this. Let's go to Joel. If we go to the book of Joel, where are you, Joel? Joel chapter 1 is connected to the first coming of the Lord pre-trib, right, in the 40 days. The second one is him coming at the end of seals. And the third one is his, is his coming at the end feet down. Look at chapter 2 of Joel connected, see, to the seventh year of seals or the big picture 14. Watch this. Look what it says in Joel chapter 2. And I want you to remember what it said in 2nd Esdras. What did it say? Then shall he stand on top of Mount Zion, and Zion will come to be made manifest. So it's hidden. It's going to be made manifest to all people prepared and built. What is it? It is a mountain carved without hands. Well, this isn't the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is him coming with a mountain that's going to be a stone that's going to turn into a mountain and it's going to be made manifest to all people, which is why they were freaking out. And it's the place prepared and built. So look what happens if we go now to Joel chapter 2, which is a picture of the Lord coming, the day of the Lord, of him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. Blow ye the trumpet. It's Feast of Trumpets, remember? Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Hello. Then it talks about all the craziness that takes place. Um, we see, listen to this. We'll talk about this again in another video, actually, too. But it says, um, be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God for he hath given you the former rain moderately and will cause to come down for you the rain, Christ, the former and the latter in the first month and the floors shall be full of wheat. Hello. Now it will be full of wheat. But where was he? Blow the trumpet in my holy mountain. Second Esdras said it was him coming with, on, uh, he's going to be on Mount Zion. It's going to be made manifest. Well, guess what? If you go to Daniel chapter 2, we got the same story. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream? He interprets the dream and he says that the ten toes, where are we? And da, 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 and he, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So what did we see? We saw the ten toes, right? The toes, the feet and the toes and the toes are part of iron and part of clay. There were 10 of them. How many horns are there on the beast? In Revelation 17, there were 10 horns. They're the same picture of the 10 toes. And what does it say in 17? That the beast, they, they give their power, the 10 kings, which are the 10 horns, give their power unto the beast who gives them a kingdom. And they're going to work with the beast and they're going to make war with the lamb when he comes and the lamb is going to overcome them and defeat them what is he coming on he's coming with heavenly mount zion the place that's going to be made manifest it's going to be a stone that's going to smite the image and become a great mountain again this cannot be him coming feet down on the mount of olives it's him coming with the place about to be made manifest, which it said was a place prepared. Pretty interesting how that works, right? So he's coming on a place prepared. Well, check this out. When is he going to gather the great multitude rapture? In the midst of the seventh year of seals, which is like chapter 14, right? So if we go to John 21 chapters, it's the big picture, chapter 14. 
So if we go to John, we go to John chapter 14. 14th year, 14th chapter, 14th year of the big picture, which is the 7th year of seals. Did we see this already, or was it from my previous teaching that I had to delete? We go to John chapter 14, and what do we see? In verse 2, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there you may be also what is he coming on brothers and sisters he's coming on heavenly mount zion the place prepared where he is going to receive his great multitude rapture wild isn't it absolutely incredible when you could track these things when you follow them which means what which means he's now here on heavenly Mount Zion. He's destroyed the enemies. Daniel 7 tells us that he has killed the beast, but the rest of the beasts, so he's killed the Antichrist beast, but the rest of the beasts had their dominions and power taken away. Which means what? It was the end of the beast of Revelation 13 in the portion of his was you see his 14 months ended at the end of the sixth year of seals at the coming of the lord on heavenly mount zion the place prepared where he's receiving them you want to know why you can prove this out that he's on heavenly mount zion let's go to zechariah chapter 8 again which is the beginning of the seven years of trumpet judgments or the eighth year of tribulation with the Lord now there on heavenly Mount Zion. If we go to Zechariah chapter eight, scroll over, Zechariah chapter eight, right there in the same connection. We call it chapters to years, there it is. The Lord would be on heavenly Mount Zion. So we go to Zechariah chapter eight, and listen to what it says. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy. I was jealous for her with a great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned. What did he say in, 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 uh, in John 14? I am returned, right? I will come again and receive you unto myself that, that where I am there you may be also. So now this is, after that and he's now received the great multitude rapture and he's there on heavenly mount zion over jerusalem whatever that might look like and it says i am returned unto zion and will dwell in the midst of jerusalem and jerusalem shall be called the city of truth listen to this the holy mountain of the lord of hosts All right the mountain of the lord of hosts the holy mountain <clears throat> and what did we see comes after that they're now going to start rebuilding the city, the street, and the temple. And it'll be done after three and a half years, which equals what? The 1260 days. This is the period of time when the beast is not. He is not starting over here in the seventh year of seals, but he is not until... The city, streets, and temple are complete, just as 1 Kings 6 said, in the 11th year. In the 11th year. Which means exactly the time frame of the prophetic picture in the fourth year of the foundation, and now the temple is being built. And while it's being built, the Lord who came on heavenly Mount Zion receive them into that heavenly mount zion place prepared which is paradise is now there on mount zion over jerusalem the hundred and forty four thousand they're the second watch okay that first disciple group from luke was the first watch the second watch 
is the 144,000. They're the ones that get sealed. They're the first fruits of the grapes. Remember the grapes? I said we're ready at the same time for harvest as spring wheat. Pretty fascinating, right? And it just so happens the 144,000 are sealed first. And when they're sealed, when the grapes are ready, it's when the spring wheat is ready. And so the great multitude rapture is ready. It's being harvested, but it cannot be brought in or used until, I believe, six or seven months later after bearing the bones at second Passover. Pretty incredible, right? We just showed all throughout Scripture, it tells us he's coming on Heavenly Mount Zion at the seventh year of seals. When he comes on Heavenly Mount Zion, watch this. Who is he coming as? Well, if we go to Genesis, okay, Genesis chapter 14, who is the Lamb, right? Who is the Lord coming as in Genesis 14? You got Adam who rescues Lot. Yes, that's a picture of the great multitude rapture. And who shows up? Melchizedek. You see, spiritually, we all know that Messiah is our high priest and king, Melchizedek. But his fulfillment of it is coming at the end of seals. He is coming as high priest and king, Melchizedek. And what did they bring to him? Bread and wine what's the timing of bread and wine the fall feasts when spring wheat the younger wheat is ready to harvest and the grapes crazy right this is the first time melchizedek shows up in scripture chapter 14 right at the time in the chapters to years where it's prophetically revealed that the lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion as high priest and King Melchizedek. Which means this is the end of Mark's gospel. This is the end of the time of Mark's gospel. So if we go to Mark, watch what happens. We go to Mark chapter 16 and listen to what it says. In verse 19, the end of Mark's gospel. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up un into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Remember when I told you the importance of the differences in the Gospels? The end of each Gospel is a different story. Mark's is the only one where it says he sat on the right hand of, the, of, of God. Want to know why that's so fantastic? Because remember, we're talking about Melchizedek. When he comes as Melchizedek, high priest and king, which is going to be at the end of the sixth year of seals. He's then going to sit on the right hand of God the Father as the actual, in, in this physical, whatever is going to be seen when he comes with this place prepared. He's coming as the actual Melchizedek, high priest and king. Let me prove it to you. Remember, this is the end of seals. This is the end of the sixth year of seals. So let's see what Psalms 110 has to say about the right hand of the Father in Melchizedek. Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord Father said unto my Lord Jesus, the Son, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Listen to this, verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. <laughs> Have you ever tried to understand Psalms 110 before in your life? You've just seen it played out. End of the sixth year of seals, seated on the right hand of the Father, ruling still in the midst of his enemies. He is the high priest and king Melchizedek. He's going to be seated at the right hand of the Father, 
striking through kings in the day of his wrath, which is the wrath of the lamb when he strikes through the ten kings and the beast. Wild, right? And it even said, as Melchizedek, in the 14th chapter, the very first place it shows up. Want me to show you another fantastic one? It just so happens to be in the same place. You go to the book of Hebrews. It has 13 chapters from year one to the end of the 13th year. What happens if you go to chapter seven? Chapter seven equals, you guessed it, the seventh year of seals. Look at what Hebrews chapter seven has to say at the exact same lineup of years to the seventh year of seals. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God. It's all about Melchizedek, the high priest and king coming, who is the greater than Aaron. At the exact same chapter to year verse that equals the seventh year of seals. You're seeing it all right here, guys. All of these things laid out. Look at this half hour. About half hour, silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Many, many people wonder what on earth is that about the seventh seal? Well, now you know who's here, don't you? The Son of Man is here. The Lord is here. The Lamb is here. He is the high priest and king. He's received, he's sealed the 144. The, the great multitude rapture has come in. Now you can understand why Revelation 14, you see, out of the 21, 22 years, you can look at that and say, look at Revelation 14. The lamb is standing on what? Mount Zion with the 144,000. You see? So now what happens? Now that you know that the lamb is here, it's when he came in the clouds. Okay? That's what you were seeing in Matthew chapter 13. It was him coming on the day and hour no one knows, and he was coming in the clouds, plural. That's him coming on heavenly Mount Zion, destroying the ten kings and the beast. So now you know that he's here. So going to Revelation chapter 8, and seeing that there was silence in heaven after this battle and after bringing in the great multitude rapture, it's like a breather is going to take place. A big sigh of whew is going to take place. But what else do you think is going to take place? It's not just this silence. It's going to be this time of calm, of silence, like the definition says for about the space of half an hour, which is leaving what? About six months. It's six or seven months, most likely seven months, before the great multitude rapture happens, which leaves about half a year, or in the typology, a half hour of silence of about five months. What do you think is going to happen after the world has just gone through everything of seals, had been worshiping the beast, and now he's being destroyed, or he's been destroyed, and the ten kings with him, when the world saw Mount Zion coming down, and they're freaking out, and the Lord destroys them, seals the 144, gathers the great multitude to paradise, the place of Mount Zion that he came with, do you think the rest of the world is going to want a little breather? They're going to want more than a breather. Remember what we just read. Psalms 110 said now that, he's, that he is as, Mal, as uh, Melchizedek, high priest and king, they're going to what? He's going to rule in the midst of his enemies. So he's still going to rule in the midst of his enemies, but what is he going to do here? He's going to make a covenant. This is where the Lord 
not the Antichrist, not the beast. Seven-year tribbers think the Antichrist is going to build the temple or oversee the temple and then go step into it and declare himself God. Never once in all of history was the temple ever built by, by the beast or by the, by the Antichrist type. Never. Remember what it said about the foundation? Zerubbabel laid it, and Zerubbabel will complete it. We don't know who this modern-day Zerubbabel will for sure be. I have a suspicion, but that's it. It's not only going to be Christ there. Christ is the high priest and king, and whoever this modern-day Zerubbabel will be, will be there with them. And Zerubbabel will be overseeing the rebuilding of the temple and all the rebuilding. While Messiah is overseeing the 144,000 as they go out, and they're, he, he's with them wheresoever they go. He is the high priest and king. But what did it say? It said that he's going to still rule in the midst of his enemies. You got to remember during the next during the next uh, 1260 days. There's still going to be the first four trumpet judgments. Four trumpets are going to break out while the city streets and temple are going to be rebuilt. Because the Lord is still going to be in on Zion and ruling in the midst of it in the cloud, whatever that might look like. But all not, everybody's not going to suddenly turn and worship them. They're still not going to understand. Most of the people will have fallen to them, and don't forget, many will still have the mark of the beast. Hello. So what's the Lord going to do in this half hour of silence? He's going to make a covenant. He's going to make a covenant. If we go to Daniel <clears throat> chapter 9, we spoke about it in the last video to help people understand seven weeks is seven years, and then about three and a half years is the three score and two. That's seven years, about three and a half years, and then he's cut off. So, what ends up happening? Clearly, you're going to be able to understand that Messiah must be the one to make a covenant when he comes at the end of seals, which I believe the covenant will be made in that half hour of silence at the seventh seal. We see this in uh, Jeremiah, I believe, 31. In 31... We've got this great prophecy that I've explained a number of times. When you go to the uh, Septuagint, the original translation, it says 31 verse 8 of Jeremiah, Behold, I will bring them from the north country. I will gather them from the coasts of the earth. Uh, and with them, the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travails, together a great multitude. And do you know what it says? In the original Septuagint translation, that he would gather them at Passover. What did we say the great multitude would happen at? Passover. Maybe the first, but I believe it will be the fulfillment of second Passover. It says at Passover in the Septuagint. This, we have known this before we knew that from the Septuagint. We knew from the prophetic understanding that this was talking about the great multitude rapture. And then when we found out it was Passover, do you realize how, how important that is? Do you realize how, how the day and hour no one knows is the Lord coming at the end of six years? Which means six months or seven months later is first or second Passover. Which means if it started the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets, that two and a half years later, when the mark of the beast and he gets his power, that they would flee as they did with Moses into the wilderness at the time of Passover. You see how every intricate detail is connected? So what does he do? Well, here's the great multitude rapture. And what are we looking for next? This half hour of silence. Well, look at what happens. 
he ends up talking about the new covenant he's going to make. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Who is the house of Israel? Mark's group. The house of Israel have the Gentiles grafted in into them. Let me show you a great little picture of this in Genesis chapter 8. In Genesis chapter 8, we have a picture of the end of the 40 days in verse 6, which is like the beginning, the 40 days of the Son of Man from earlier. I was talking about then the raven goes out, is like the Ishmael, and it, it means Arab. Okay, that's the compassing about. And then you've got the dove, which is the picture of the 50th day. And then the dove is gone. And then what happened? Then Jerusalem was attacked and destroyed. And that's the beginning of the 14 years. And what do we see? The dove leaves. And in verse 10, it said, and he stayed. It's the word for tribulation. Seven days. So it's a picture of seven days of seven years. And then verse 12, there's another stayed seven days of seven years. So it's like a picture of seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And it's the 6,000th year when it's all over. So listen to what it says in this typology, in this prophetic type pic picture in the seven days of years. Then the dove goes out again. So think of this in that seventh year. And what happens? And the dove came in uh, and the dove came to him in the evening and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. An olive what? An olive leaf can also mean an olive branch plucked off. What's the word for harpazo, for rapture? To pluck. Who is the Mark group? The Mark group is the Gentiles grafted in the wild olive branch, grafted into the natural which means the Gentiles have been growing the left behind church Gentiles that will wake up as part of the great multitude in the greatest revival in human history during the time of seals. They are the grafted in wild olive branch into the natural tree. And so for what over 2000 years, they've been growing and blending together. So when you see this, this, branch broken off it's the it's the great multitude rapture mark's group represents the house of israel and it represents the whole world outside of judah who are the jews because the 10 tribes have gone and mixed and scattered with all of the gentiles throughout the world the great multitude rapture is the house of Israel. It's the house of Israel. And what happens after the great multitude rapture? Judah is going to come in. After the great multitude rapture comes in, and you see that covenant that's made? That's because the house of Judah is going to come in, in later in that seventh year of seals as well. Watch this. If we go to Zechariah chapter 8, which is the first year of trumpet judgments, listen to what it says. We know that they're going to start rebuilding. We know the Lord is on Mount Zion. We know that for seven years they couldn't rebuild because of the tribulation. Only the foundation was laid. But listen now what he says. First year of trumpet judgments. Zechariah 8 verse 13. And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of, house of Israel and house of Judah, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Which means Judah. The house of Judah will also be brought to Jerusalem, will be brought back from their captivity, and will be involved in the rebuilding. Which means in Jeremiah chapter 31, after the great multitude rapture, and Judah 
then also coming in, and how else do we know this? I've shared on this again uh, uh, before, not too long ago. We know this as well because the Jews were blinded for our sakes. They were blinded for the Gentiles. They were blinded for the world. They were made enemies for our sakes in it. Well, when, when the Gentile time is over, when seals comes to an end, it will return back to the Jews. And his focus will be on them. Well, the timing not only is perfect, because most of the Jews that understand their scriptures but don't believe in Messiah, or, or believe their scriptures in part, but don't believe in the New Testament of Messiah, they're waiting for a Messiah who is going to come and destroy their enemies that, that made them scatter. Well, they haven't scattered yet, have they? And they're waiting for the Messiah that will rebuild the temple. Guess what? When the Lord comes at the end of the sixth seal, he's going to destroy all the enemies that scattered them, and the temple is going to start to get rebuilt. Hello. They're not going to fall for the Antichrist. They know who their Messiah, they will be ready because the Lord blinded them for that so that we could come in. As Isaiah says, if he didn't blind them in Isaiah 6, if he didn't blind them, they would have recognized them. And then we would have all been left out in the dark. So the Lord did it for our sakes. And so what's going to happen at the end of, right towards the end of seven years of seals, the last few months, he's going to what? He's going to make a new covenant. It's the prophetic typology. It's the covenant that is still to come. Crazy, right? You know how we can prove it? Let's prove it with more detail. Daniel chapter 9. Now that you know that Messiah is going to be here, and you come to Daniel chapter 9, and it says, the commandment to restore and to build unto Messiah the prince seven weeks, because seven years, they're not going to be rebuilding except the foundation. And then about three and a half years, they're going to rebuild the wall and the street again and the temple, even in troublous times. And after those about three and a half years, look at what it says. Shall Messiah be cut off? This is actually Messiah. This is Melchizedek, high priest and king, who will then be cut off. Well, what happens when he gets cut off? That's from the end of seals, right? The, to the start of, say, the start of trumpets with the rebuilding. Then he's going to be cut off. When he's cut off, if he made a covenant and he's going to get cut off, he's going to have to break that covenant, which would be in that 11th year after the city streets and temple were built, right? So look at what we see. 144, he's on Mount Zion. The 144 are doing their ministry for the first three and a half years. He's made the covenant. It continues until the midst of the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years in. Well, it just so happens Psalms 90 and 10 said 70 years. Hello, right? 70 to 80 is 10 years. And then soon, which is a few months, maybe up to six months, then we is I'm cut then cut off, and we fly away. So right where Messiah is cut off, after about three and a half years into trumpet judgments, after the city streets and temple have been rebuilt, while the 144 are out doing their ministry, what has to happen? The covenant that Messiah made, he has to break at mid-trumpets in the 11th year, just like 1 Kings, just like what Daniel 9 is showing, and just like the 11th year. Let's go see what the 11th year is like. Let's go to see what Zechariah says. Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 11 in the 11th year. And what does Zechariah chapter 11 tell us? tells us Satan's been cast down. The vintage of old has come down. And what does the Lord have to do? In verse 10, Zechariah 11, verse 10, 
and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I made with all people, and it was broken in that day. When? After the temple, after the foundation, and then the city streets and temple was rebuilt. You see, there was no beast during that time. Remember, if you go to Daniel chapter 7, in Daniel chapter 7, we're told that only the beast was killed. Right? Uh, do, 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 do. So there's the beast who had the ten horns. Okay? And then the Ancient of Days comes. That's the father coming down, right? There he is. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And then the lamb is going to be brought to him. And look at what it says. Uh, verse 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to a burning flame. He's cast into the pit. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So that means during the first half of trumpets, we see the beast is not just like the next part of Revelation 17 when it says the beast is not. He was for 42 months, then he is not. Because this is while Messiah is here and he's got a covenant. The rebuilding is taking place. It's now what? The Church of Philadelphia. The Church of Philadelphia is all about the 144,000. Historically, Philadelphia is representation of the missionaries. Pretty wild, right? It's the 144,000 that are going out during that first half of trumpets. Crazy. It's amazing to see how it all comes together. And so what's happening is he's there on Mount Zion. The beast is not. And we now know that Mark's portion is over. Mark's portion is over. So now we're talking about the seven years of trumpets and we're talking about Judah's portion. Judah and, and the Jews, they weren't taken up to paradise. Theirs is the city. This is why it's so important to understand what Paul is prophetically telling us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years this is the pre-trib going to the third heaven. Verse 3, I knew such a man, not quite as strong in Christ, but the ones during seals, that'll be part of the great multitude rapture, that are caught up to paradise. Right when paradise is coming. And then he says, the third time I'm ready to come to you. You see what happened? There's a taking, a taking, and... A coming to them because theirs is the city they're going to inherit the millennial reign and the city when the Lord returns feet down so what we're seeing here is the beast in the first half of trumpets isn't there because he was killed at the end of seals at the end of the six year seals but what about the false prophet. Well, the false prophet wasn't killed. Remember, none of the other beasts got killed, but their power and the dominion taken away. So if we go to Matthew's discourse in chapter 24, which is a typology of like, it's the start of now the seven years of trumpet judgments. Look what happens. In the first half, before the next abomination of desolation, only false prophets mentioned. Remember in the first half of Mark's, there was no mention of false Christs or false prophets. And that's because he didn't, doesn't get his power till about Middish seals. So there was no mention in the first half of Mark's discourse of false Christs or false prophets. At the abomination of desolation in Mark, the first abomination, which is the mark of the beast, just like, at, just like Moses, 
Remember they had a portable temple in the wilderness? It was a portable temple covered in flesh. And during seals, the, the, the temple of God is still in believers. The mark of the beast is on the people temple. Because it's still in the believer during seals. The temple within. And so once the mark comes and the beast shows up, that's when they flee into the wilderness and the mark of the beast comes into the portable temple for those who reject the Lord. When now he is killed, when the beast is killed at the end of the sixth year of seals and false prophet isn't killed because he's called one of the beasts, we know only the Antichrist beast was killed, so he is not. So in the first half of Matthew's discourse, there's no beast mentioned, but the false prophet is mentioned. Pretty crazy, right? Pretty wild. And what's happening during this time? Well, as I said earlier, the first four trumpets are taking place. Does that mean one, one year, one the next year, next? No. We've talked about that, right? We don't know exactly how these are all going to play out. Is it going to be one one year and one the next or a portion and they come together and one continues and one? We don't know. But what we do know is that these first four trumpet judgments will take place during the first three and a half years of the trumpet tribulation judgments. The, the eighth year to the ten and a half years. It'll last about what? Twelve 160 days. 1260 days during the Lord's covenant time, while the rebuilding of the city, street, and temple is happening, while the weapons are burning, right? They're burning them for fuel. They've turned them back, their weapons into plowshares. The Lord is on heavenly Mount Zion. The 144 are out ministering, and the beast is not, and the false prophet is probably in hiding. Remember what it said in Psalms 110. He's going to be ruling in the midst of his enemies. Not everybody is going to accept the covenant. Not everybody is going to side with him. They're not all going to come suddenly worshiping and believing him. The 144 are going to be out ministering though. And how long is this going to last? <clears throat> Three and a half years approximately, right? 1260 days the time of the first four trumpets because those trumpet judgments are falling around different places around the world and in different parts of the earth. Of course, not in Jerusalem. Mount Zion's there. The rebuilding and everything's taking place. What happens at mid-trumpets about ten and a half years into all of tribulation? The first woe now comes. The 1260 days are done. When the 1260 days are done, if we go to Revelation chapter 12, we see that when the 1260 days are over, the time that Michael and his angels were fighting against the dragon who is Satan and his angels, Satan is now cast out. And when he's cast out, the world is going to be in a panic. This is now going to be worse than even mid-seals. It's going to be worse than at any time in human history ever because it's now the time of the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet, and it's time for gr his great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. And he's going to go after the woman who is then going to fly on the wings of a great eagle into a place protected where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time. So what do you got? This was your 1260, and then what happens? Then you have your, where is it? Right here. Woman flies away into the wilderness for a time, comma, and times, and a half a time. This flying away is the Psalms 90 and 10, 10 years, a short time, and then fly away for a time, and times, and half a time from Revelation 12, 14, which means... They're going to be taken away, protected, until the end of the 14th year. 
So from when Satan is cast down and goes after them with a flood, which is exactly as Daniel 9 said would happen when Messiah gets cut off. So in Daniel 9, 26, Messiah is now cut off. He gets cut off at the first woe, which is why Zechariah 11 said he breaks his covenant. He's got to break that covenant because Satan has been cast down. And when Satan is cast down at the first woe, the pit is opened. And what does he do? He's going to go after them with a flood. This is in the 11th year, about 10 and a half years in. And then unto the end of the war, which means a war has to happen at this point, and there has to be an end of it. It's crazy. How long does this war last? Well, we saw that at, when Messiah gets cut off at the 10 and a half year point, because Satan's been cast down, we know that they fly away on the wings of an eagle for the final three and a half years to the end of 14 years. But you guys all know this one very well. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, halfway through, and it's saying, how long will these things go on, Lord? How long? And he says, it shall be for a time, comma, times, and half a time, and a half. There's no end here, which means it's one, two, and a half. Whereas Revelation 12, 14 it said time and times and half a time, which means they're gone for the final three and a half years to a place protected. But Satan's time from Messiah's cutoff, Satan has two and a half years of the final three and a half years. This is the time that Satan knows, but his time is short. And he comes after the temple has been built is when he's cast down so that Messiah in Zechariah 11 breaks his covenant because Satan has been cast down. When Satan is cast down, what happens? Watch this. When Satan is cast down, Revelation chapter 9 tells us, the fifth angel sounded, which is the first woe, and a star fell and a key was given unto him. For what? The key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. So the bottomless pit is opened at the fifth trumpet, which is ten and a half years into tribulation. What does Zechariah, I'm uh, sorry, what does Revelation 11 say about what happens at that point? Verse 11, uh, sorry, Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit hello satan is cast down the pit is open the beast that was and then was not now is again right it's the shall be what is he going to do he's going to make war against the two witnesses who were finished after the 1260 days Satan is cast down. Satan is going to have two and a half years after he's cast down and he opens the pit. And when he opens the pit, you have the first beast now returning, as it said in Revelation 11, when it said shall ascend. So it said what? Was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. How long does he have? He has two and a half years with Satan and with the false prophet again, because the false prophet has never left, which means at mid trumpets, at the next abomination of desolation, this time the abomination of desolation is going to be in the finished temple. Funny how that works, right? Temple is now rebuilt. Now it's going to be the abomination after the pit is open and he comes up as the son of perdition. And now he's going to stand in the temple. You see, over here it was a mark to represent him. Over here he's going to stand in the temple. He needed the temple to be built before that could happen. Was, is not, shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And when he, go, when he comes out of the bottomless pit, what did it say? 
he's going to make war against them. Well, we know that he only has 42 months with Satan to do this, and it's only going to be, uh, sorry, not 42 months, uh, two and a half years of the final three and a half years to do this. And so, remember in Daniel 9, he told us in Daniel 9 that Messiah is going to be cut off, not for himself. Then what? They're going to go after them with a flood? That's the beginning of, of the first final three and a half years. And how long is the war going to last? Well, we just found out. Two and a half years from when Satan is cast down, the pit is open, they come out of the pit, and now the beast is back again, and this time as the son of perdition. Well, guess what? You go to Matthew chapter 24. Watch this. The end of Matthew at the what? After the abomination of desolation, remember, only the false prophet was still there in the first half of trumpets. Then you get the abomination of desolation, which is the second abomination of desolation. But this one is what? In the holy place. This one's the actual physical rebuilt temple. So now they're going to flee again. And when would this fleeing take place? <laughs> you guessed it. Passover. Because if it starts at the Feast of Trumpets and it's three and a half years, three and a half years would be Feast of Trumpets. Like when they flee away in the wilderness. It's the same picture. It's the same picture. Isn't that crazy? So then what happens? Now, you have the abomination of desolation. They Satan's been cast down. Beast comes back out of the pit. And it's absolute mayhem on the earth. They goes, he's going to go into the temple, just like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, or is it 3? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's now the time of the great falling away, and the son of perdition is going to be revealed. It's the time of the great falling away? Well, guess what? Laodicea of the seven churches of the end of days of apostasy were in it right now. But when the tribulation starts, it starts with the 50 days. The eighth day, the 40 days start. They will remain during seals. This is when Antichrist gets his power. This is when they're all in the wilderness till the end of seals. This is the Reformation when the Lord comes as the king of Israel. This is Philadelphia going out, doing their mission until Laodicea of the end of days comes again. The great apostasy right at the time. When the great falling away because the son of perdition has come because he's come what out of the pit there's only one way he could have been and then not and then come back the only way he can come out of the pit is if he was first sent there after he did his time in the beginning it is the revelation of the was is not and shall be so when we go back to matthew chapter 24 and he's going to what? He's going to stand in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. And so what happens? <clears throat> the temple is now rebuilt. It's mid trumpets, 10 and a half years in. Messiah is cut off. And look who shows up again. False Christ and false prophets, both together back on the scene. Messiah is cut off. The two and a half years, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be worse than even what it said at Mark's abomination when it said it was worse than ever will be at this point than it was since the creation. At Matthew's, it says it'll be worse than it was even then and then never will be worse than this again because now Satan is cast down. The actual pit of hell is opened. You see, you see how crazy that is? They're going to have two and a half of the final three and a half years. Which means what? We're coming to what? The end of the 13th year. Just like Abraham with Ishmael. What happened after 13? The Lord made a covenant with him. What happened with, with Jacob? Worked 20 years with his father-in-law. After 20 years, <coughs> he makes a covenant with him. Well, Messiah made a covenant. He had to break it because Satan was cast down. War broke out against them. 
And then what's going to happen? Messiah, at the end of the 13 years of tribulation, is going to what? Well, let's go to stay in Matthew 24. When is the Son of Man going to be coming? Immediately after the tribulation of those days? When is he coming? He's coming what? In the clouds? No, the word in, in Matthew only, is the word on. This is when he's coming on the clouds from one end, one end unto the other. And look at what it says. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. Why? Because it's the feast of trumpets. At the end of 13 years to start the 14th year, what is it? It's feast of trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. So when he's coming, returning on the clouds, when he will now be seen by the whole world coming on the clouds as lightning from one end unto the other, he's coming what? On the day and hour no one knows, which is the feast of trumpets. After what? Two and a half years. He is returning at this point, feet down on the Mount of Olives. In fact, what if we go to Zechariah, one of our favorite ones, right? Let's go to Zechariah again. Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14, representing the 14th year. What does he do? Zechariah chapter 14, the start of the year. It now says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle which means what he's about to go fight in a battle as he did in a previous one that was the ezekiel 39 that i showed you here was the first sword that was the revelation 17 battle but what is this battle this is the one called the second sword and this is the wrath of god this is revelation chapter 19 at the treading of the grapes of the wrath of almighty god what is revelation what does zechariah 14 say and his feet shall stand in that day upon the mount of olives it's when he returns for the whole world to see him feet down on the mount of olives and what's going to happen listen to this Verse 11, Zechariah 14. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the, the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouths verse 14 and judah also shall fight at jerusalem and all the wealth of the heathen round about shall be gathered together gold silver and apparel in great abundance it is the revelation 19 wrath of almighty god battle but look at this remember what happened after the seven years of burning the seventh year of seals, and then six years of trumpets. I just showed you that there was a battle and the Jews would be involved in it, in it as well. Right? And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, which means they're also going to be involved in it. Well, watch what happens. Uh, is it Joel chapter 3? Watch this. Uh, Joel chapter 3. Did I get this one right? Was it Joel chapter 3? Mm, that's overflowing. No, I forgot where it was. That was the other part. Uh, to scatter my people, plead with them, Israel, for they have scattered them among the nation. There's the other one, and now it slips my memory. Of where, oh, I think it was there in Zechariah. Yeah, see, I thought it was verse, chapter 3. Give me a second, give me a second. 
Uh, Drew to captivity. You see, he's bringing again their captivity. He's bringing them to him. Oh, yes, there it is. <clears throat> I did have it. So it says in Joel 3, remember, this is Joel 1 is the is his in the beginning 40 days, the pre-trib. Then it's his returning at the end of seals in Joel 2. And Joel 3 is his return post-trib. Proclaim ye among all the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. <clears throat> Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. You see that? Let the weak say, I am strong. Do you understand how powerful it is to realize what is being revealed in the 14 years and above? From beating your, your, your swords into plowshares and burning your weapons for seven years, you have the seventh year of seals, six years of trumpets, only to then beat them back into swords and into spears for the final battle of the Lord, which he even says, as he had one before, that he's coming again, and this time he's going to finish them. Seriously? Now watch this. How about the mystery finished in relation to the final 14th year? The mystery finished. If we go to Daniel chapter 12, it told us that it'll be time and times and a half, right? So Satan's time is two and a half of the final three and a half years, which means there's one year left after Satan's two and a half years. Listen to what it says. At, right? He's got two and a half years. He knows his time is short from, from uh, Revelation 12. He knows his time is short. It's two and a half of the final three and a half until he's what? Accomplished to scatter the holy people. All these things shall be finished. So he's got power. He's going to be able to scatter them all from Jerusalem, right? Claim power with the beast and the false prophet there. Now watch this. Revelation chapter 11. Watch this. The end of the second woe is when the when the two witnesses have been killed, then they're resurrected, right? And then the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. We just showed when he's coming. He's going to return, feet down on the Mount of Olives, on the day and hour no one knows, which is the beginning of the 14th year. Or in the big picture, 21 years, right? He's returning. Feet down on the Mount of Olives. And watch what happens. The seventh trumpet. We go to Revelation. Sorry, Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, we read in verse 7. It says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. Which means... As soon as the seventh trumpet begins to sound, which will begin the seventh, the 14th year of tribulation or the seventh year of trumpet judgments, when, when uh, the beast and Satan's two and a half years come to an end, the Lord is returning. Feet down on the Mount of Olives, right? We know Satan had two and a half years, which means the seventh trumpet is the final 14th year of tribulation or the seventh year of trumpet judgments. And what does it say? As soon as the angel begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared it to his servants, the prophets. It's over as soon as the seventh trumpet begins to sound at what? The last trump. That's why Matthew 24, at the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds, we see with a great sound of a trumpet. It's now the final 14th year, him coming on the day and hour no one knows, which means it is the Feast of Trumpets. And what? 
the two and a half years that Satan was given to scatter the people until it was finished. And Revelation chapter 10 tells us that the mystery will be finished as soon as the people that were scattered, the seventh trumpet begins to blow. And what did Matthew 24 say? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Wild, right? How about this? The days of Noah. Actually, no, before I go to the days of Noah, look at this. Confirms the covenant with many. Wait a second. Messiah made the covenant. He cuts it off because Satan's been cast down. And then what happens in the final 14th year or 21st year? Right? What happens at the end of 20 or the end of 13? We saw Jacob make a covenant, right? I was saying that earlier. Made a covenant with his father-in-law. We saw the father make a God make a covenant with Abraham at from 86 and then 99 after 13 years when Ishmael was now 13. We saw when Jacob after he finished 20, which means to start the 14th or to start the 21st, there's the covenant. And what do we see in Daniel chapter 9? As you now understand, nine better than you probably ever have before, especially if you're newer. Ten and a half years to the cutoff. The pit is open, goes after them with a the flood to the end of the war, which is two and a half years, which means this is the end of 13 years total. Look at what verse 27 says. And he shall confirm the covenant with many. Who's the one confirming the covenant? Messiah. The Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. He is confirming the covenant that he made with many that he had to cut off because Satan was cast down and the pit was opened. And war broke out against them for two and a half years. What's going to happen in the final 14th year? Well, there's a war. They got to beat their plowshares back. Satan is going to be bound. Uh, uh, the beast and false prophet are going to be the first two cast into the lake of fire alive. And while all this is happening, that group, remember, is still protected until the end of the 14th year. So what about the days of Noah, which we call cleanup? There's a reason why in all of the discourses, the days of Noah are only mentioned in Matthews. And where is it mentioned in Matthew's gospel? There's mid trumpets, right? There's the false Christ, false prophet. Until what? Until the coming of the Son of Man, which is the start of the 14th year. On the day and hour, no one knows. And it will be as it was in the days of Noah. Which means the true understanding of as it was in the days of Noah from Matthew 24 has nothing to do with all of tribulation. It's specifically speaking to the final year of the days of Noah. It's the equivalent of the one year of Noah's time. And what? It begins at the Feast of Trumpets day and hour no one knows. And what is it? It's not only the 14th year or the last seven. It's not only the 21st year or the last seven. It is the 49th year of the seven times seven years that we began this with, which means the next year is the Jubilee. Well, do you know, and I've shared this many times, so it's only for new people. Everybody else will be, yes, I know. Do you know that the days of Noah, knowing the reason why it's only at the end of Matthew's discourse portion, at the return of the Lord, at the day and hour no one knows, is because the days of Noah, watch this, are one year, it began on the second month, 17th day, and it ends one year later, plus 10 days, on the second month, 27th day. It is one year and 10 days long for the days of Noah. And the days of Noah 
where it is in Matthew reveals that it is the final 14th year or 49th year of a Jubilee cycle. And yet it's one year and 10 days. Why would it be one year and 10 days for Noah being only mentioned in the discourses at the end of Matthew's when the Lord has come on the day and hour no one knows, which means Feast of Trumpets? Well, because the 49th year in a Jubilee cycle, brothers and sisters, the 49th year, seven times seven years, 49. So when the 49 years are done, what does it say? Then shall thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. The days of Noah are one year and 10 days. They begin at the Feast of Trumpets. One year later exactly is Feast of Trumpets, but 10 more days on the Day of Atonement. The only year where a year is one year plus 10 days is the 49th year because that final 49 years or that final 49th year, the 10th day later on the Day of Atonement proclaims liberty in the land, declaring the jubilee of the final jubilee, the proclaiming of liberty in the land. And do you want to know what this proclaiming of liberty in the land is like? Watch this. If you go to, where is it? Ezekiel. Again, here's Ezekiel. What happens in Ezekiel? This should be 47 here. We missed number 47, but that's okay. Uh, Ezekiel 48 is the Jubilee year. What does Ezekiel 48 tell us? Well, do you remember what happened? A group was protected in the wilderness till the end of the 49 years, right? Till the end of the 14th year till after he had destroyed all of the enemies. Are they going to be brought back on the day and hour no one knows? Right? At the end of 14? No. They're going to be brought back 10 days later at the Jubilee trumpet on the Day of Atonement to proclaim the liberty. And when they do, those that were protected, all of Judah, right? Those that are promised the millennial reign will return to the land and what will they be given? Well, when liberty is proclaimed, what does it say? It'll proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession. Look what happens when you go to Ezekiel chapter 48, which in the chapter to year count equals the jubilee year when the shofar has been sounded on the Day of Atonement, and they return. Now these are the names of the tribes for which what? They're now going to start receiving their portion of land. Dan's border, Asher's border, Naphtali's border. All of the lands of the tribes are going to be given back to them when they receive the shofar blast in the place protected in the wilderness they're all going to return to the land and they're going to enjoy their promised millennial reign exactly as was promised to them all the way back in the beginning. Now watch this as we bring this to a close. There's a third watch. You see, in all of these watches are clearly revealed to us in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, starting in 35, he says, Let your loins be girded about, and you yourselves like men waiting for the Lord when he returns from the wedding, that when he knocks, you may open unto him immediately. This is the first watch. This is that remnant Luke group, those disciples we were talking about that will be with him for 40 days and at least during the time of seals. If they open unto him when he comes and they find him watching, he's going to sit with them and serve them and eat with them. This is the banquet meal he's going to have with them after the wedding that he's having in heaven. Then what do we see? Verse 38. 
And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and so find them, blessed are those servants. What's the second watch? You guessed it. The 144,000. The 144,000 are the second watch. The third watch is after the Lord has dealt with destroying the enemies and nobody was brought back until that final 14th year was over. And then what is he going to do? He's going to anoint the third watch. These three watches are revealed to us in the last chapter of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. This is the disciple group on the road to Emmaus and he sits down to eat and break bread and bless them and has this meal with them. He only does this in Luke's gospel. It says he's going to the scriptures are opened unto them and they were given understanding uh, of all things that must be fulfilled from Moses, the prophets and the Psalms concerning him. And what does he tell them? And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and what does he tell them you are witnesses remember I told you it will begin from Jerusalem they'll receive the Acts 2.0 anointing and they will begin from Jerusalem and be spread throughout the world and what would they be they would be his witnesses not the trumpet judgment witnesses like the Messiah and Zerubbabel but the two but the witnesses represented on the two on the road to Emmaus who represent the Moses and Elijah's in these groups of thousands of people. And then what does he say? I will send you the promise of my father. This is the group who will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the 50 day, on the 50th day. What is Mark's group? Well, you saw earlier that Mark's group, he told them, or it was said after he anoints them that he was now going to be received up to sit on the right hand of God the Father. We know that that happens at the end of the sixth year of seals. And what does he do after the end of the sixth seal? When they see him coming, then the first thing he does is he seals the 144,000. And what does it say to them? Them he unbraids on. They, it's like they weren't prepared when he came. And it says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture with the first group of workers before they go out and work during that time of trumpet judgments. So, and it says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues and they shall take up serpents. Remember, they're going to be working during trumpet judgments, right? There's going to be serpents. They shall take up serpents, and if any drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. This is the 144 at the end of seals, just like the right hand, the Lord sitting now on the right hand of the Father as high priest and king Melchizedek. Just like Psalms 110. And listen to what it says, the last verse. And they went forth preaching everywhere, and the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following because he's there now on mount zion with them just like revelation 14 and who is this third and final watch watch how incredible this is this third watch goes out for the millennial reign okay they don't just work it's not a seals or a trumpet time this group is the millennial reign workers watch this in the end of matthew Listen to their great commission. It is completely different from Luke and Mark's, which themselves are both different. But in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Do you know why it's saying that? Go to Revelation chapter 11, the seventh trumpet, and listen to what it says. There were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. It is now the Lord pictured here, having returned feet down on the Mount of Olives, destroying the enemies. And what does it say? All power in heaven and on earth is now his. He's destroyed them. Go ye therefore and teach. 
No preaching for these guys. Why? Because the whole world knows that the Lord is here now, that he has returned as lightning from one end unto heaven unto the other, and the whole world has seen him. There's no more preaching, only teaching. And baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Which means what? They're going to be learning the ways of the Lord and how to observe and, and, and go and honor him at the times appointed. And lo, listen to this, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. That, brothers and sisters, is the third watch that will remain to work during the millennial reign, teaching the people the ways of the Lord. <clears throat> first watch from Mark's group. Second watch from Mark's group. Sorry, first watch from Luke's group. Second watch from Mark's group. Third watch from Matthew's group or from the tribes and go out during the entirety of the millennial reign. There's your, again, we have the treading of the wine press. That's Revelation 19. And let's finish it up with this. The first resurrection. The first resurrection is a special, you can say it's kind of like a special group. Because remember, the apostles were anointed and they worked during seals. <coughs> the 144 are sealed and they work during trumpets. The 12 tribes are anointed at the end of tribulation and work the millennial reign. The apostles relate to the foundations being laid. The 144 relate to the time of the walls when the city and the streets are being rebuilt. The 12 tribes during the third watch, during the, during the millennial reign, they relate to the gates through which everybody is going to enter. But one group is left out. And that is the Luke remnant who are the first watch. You see, the apostles aren't called one of the watches. It's the apostles, the second watch, the third watch. And what is their portion? In Revelation chapter 20 or 21. In Revelation chapter 21, we see one of my favorite pieces that I've shared on many times. We see New Jerusalem coming down from heaven at the end of the millennial reign. And look at how it's described. <clears throat> it has 12 foundations, and that's the name of the apostles. They have a wall. It has a wall with 150. 44 cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel 144 cubits 144 thousand during the time of the rebuilding of the wall and the city and the streets and the temple you see so you've got the apostles representing the foundation you've got the 144 representing the wall and you have the 12 tribes that represent the 12 gates through which that third watch the people will enter during the millennial reign to know how to worship the Lord because they have been taught by the 12 tribes who represent the 12 gates. But who isn't in this picture is the first watch, that Luke group. And the reason for it is because Revelation chapter 20 tells us who this group is that takes part in the first resurrection and that is those who put their necks on the line and were beheaded for the witness and testimony of god did not worship the, the beast receive a mark this isn't everybody these are the group that worked that were the disciples with the lord during 40 days and followed him and then when out during seals after being anointed by the Holy Ghost, they put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles during the time of the mark of the beast during seals. And they're going to be resurrected to reign with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, so everybody else, 
will not be resurrected until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So this group is the one called the first resurrection. And it says, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. This is the group from the 40 days with the Son of Man, the chosen remnant bride group that was chosen to remain, that the Lord told he, they would stay. He has chosen them to serve him. They're going to remain and put their necks on the line during seals. They're the ones who will be part of the first resurrection on, on which the second death has no part, has no power. And how do we know? Because as we've shown, they are Smyrna. They're the ones who will be cast into prison and some of them killed. And what does it say? Revelation 2.11, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Powerful stuff, brothers and sisters. Which means the apostles, the second watch, and the third watch are all part of New Jerusalem coming down, but the first watch group is not part of New Jerusalem coming down because they remained with the Lord in the first resurrection and will not be going up to New Jerusalem because they will always be with the Lord. They're his priests and reigning with them. Brothers and sisters, this is powerful stuff. This is the stuff, of course, after the millennial reign and and the second resurrection after the millennial reign. This is awesome stuff, guys. I think I've pretty much covered all of it. It was definitely longer than I expected, but I knew it wasn't going to be a simple, well, here's this, here's that, here's this. Take your time. Walk through it again. If you really want to study this out, take the time. Take the time. Be patient. Watch it. A piece here and a piece there. Track it into some of these scriptures and verses, the, the chapters to years. It's, it's incredible, incredible to follow. And it is all, every single part and piece of it is all been revealed from the word of God. Confirmed in sun, moon, and stars. Confirmed with, with writings from history. Confirmed with apocryphas. Confirmed with people that discovered a session and non-accession. By people who have studied the sun, moon, and stars to know when Christ was truly born. And the revelation we got from Isaiah to reveal when the 50 days would begin two months after Jesus' birth. Every part and piece of everything I have shared with you is all from Scripture. Even the old wheat, winter wheat, and the new wheat, spring wheat, is revealed, and we've spoken about it and revealed it from John chapter 4 this year as to what the Lord was telling them. And in the harvests that take place on our literal earth, winter wheat comes first. It starts in late May, early, early to mid-June, and ends around late July to early August. And spring wheat and grapes are ready in middish late September into early October, and spring wheat is not used or observed until the following year at Passover. Brothers and sisters, I pray now that Leviticus 19 and the 70th year has now been completely understood. Because what that means for each and every one of us, watching and praying and diligent in the Lord, knowing that the Lord will, re re will reward those who diligently seek him as Enoch, they're about to vanish as Enoch vanished. We are only just under three months away. So study this, be diligent, understand it, and then you could take your time and share it with others. It is all from the Word. I love you all. God bless you. God bless your families. Remember our brother in Uganda and his team. If you're able to help, do so. I love you all. God bless you.
Thanks again. Talk to you soon.